All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UVA Medical Center Hour. I'm Justin Hunter, Director of the Medical Center Hour, a program of UVA's Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics. A warm welcome to everyone, both uh, our Zoom audience and to our in-person audience today on this uh, chilly uh, end of March uh, day. Uh, and welcome to our hybrid event, uh, where we have some in-person gatherings and as well as um, our Zoom session today. I want to thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the UVA chapter of the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society, as well as the Compassionate Care Initiative in the UVA School of Nursing. As we often say with the Medical Center Hour, it's always a privilege to partner with groups across our university to make these conversations happen. Key issues in health and society are, of course, the province of all of us across this institution and beyond. And such conversations like today's are meant to be had together, not separately. So welcome. Before I introduce today's distinguished speaker, let me briefly review our format since we do have a hybrid event today. When it comes time for the question and answer uh, session after um, our speaker uh, speaks, we will have both the ability for our Zoom uh, participants and our in-person participants to ask questions. Uh, if you do have a question uh, from our audience, you're able to just uh, raise your hand and ask it, and it'll come through in our microphones. Uh, if you um, have a question on Zoom, please put it in the Q&A tab in the chat, uh, and I will uh, moderate that and pass it along to our speaker. So we, we are always and everywhere steeped in stories. There are stories that we tell about ourselves and stories that are told about us. There are stories in which we participate and stories from which we might find our, ourselves excluded. There are story, stories that are loud and soft, and there are stories that are perhaps more subtle or less subtle. And all of these stories intersect day in and day out, perhaps especially in the domain of health and healthcare. How do we make sense of these intersections? Better yet, how do we take hold of our many stories, collectively steering them toward the good? Today, we're honored to welcome Elizabeth Mintro to help us navigate these waters. A Virginia native, we welcome her back today. Uh, Elizabeth is the founder and director of the Women Writers in Medicine, a startup that is dedicated to amplifying the voices, experiences, and research of women in healthcare. A prolific writer, she has been an avid listener to others' stories across her extraordinary career, having worked across the world and especially in arenas of trauma and hardship. Her work has appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Health Affairs, STAT, and many other domains. And she is, as she describes it, a tireless advocate for the use of story as a tool for radical change. On behalf of our co-sponsors, we're delighted to welcome Elizabeth to our Medical Center Hour stage. Liz. Right, now let's get my slides happening here. And I will warn you that I am very interactive so I'm also the mother of a teenager, so I'm, I'm especially adept at pulling conversation out of folks so that we can have a real, real dialogue today. Thank you so much for, for welcoming back to your great Commonwealth. Uh, I promised I'd tell stories, so that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to start, before I get into my own history, we're going to start with a fan favorite. So I expect lots of, of interaction and, and participation here. Knight slays dragon. Tell me the story. You don't need to raise your hand. I know this is a very polite Southern space, but go ahead and jump right in. Tell me the story of Knight slays dragon. What happened? Go ahead. Once upon a day, a king met with a knight and gave the knight the charge to go and seek out the dragon. Very good, why? Why did the knight slay the dragon? Was he protecting something? That also assumes that knight was a he. A stolen treasure. 
Nice. Gold and jewelry and gems in a mountainside. Love that. <laughs> Keep going. Is there a villain? Go for it. Reagan had trampling over all the farmers' fields and running through the schools <laughs> and, and stomping on all the people. All right. Dragon, not, not a great. Dragon's the villain. Is that is fair to say? Dragon's the villain. All right. Was the was the uh, knight representing anyone? What, what, is, what does the knight community look like? The knight re represented the king and his kingdom, where all wish to live in harmony and peace. I'm surprised I haven't heard a damsel story in here too. <laughs> like, come on, where's the damsel? <laughs> What's the damsel look like? She has a lovely gown and a pointy hat with a scarf coming off of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's by the princess bride. On the dragon's path through the fields, he scooped up one of the poor little peasant girls and carried her away. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> We all know this story. It has a lot of different versions, but we know this story. And speaking of fan favorites, if I can get it. So today's conversation is going to be who tells your story? What stories do we believe of ourselves? What stories are written about ourselves? Since I am here in the hallowed grounds of Thomas Jefferson, I, I pulled a, a picture from Hamilton, uh, which famously has a score, who tells your story, right? How do we use the narratives that we are written into um, and we write as a tool to build agency and to, to make meaning. By way of background, just quickly disclaimers, since we are in a, a CE environment, uh, the only disclaimer that I have is that I am not a clinician. Um, up until December 31st, however, I studied clinicians for years, so I feel like I'm a little scarier than a white coat. Um, <laughs> consider yourself warned. My own background, I, I am a writer first and always. Um, that is how I see the world, and, and as was noted in the introduction, I found an organization called Women Writers in Medicine as a way to amplify stories of those who aren't always at the table um, by virtue of historic um, othering. Uh, so I, I am a writer, I'm a researcher, um, and do thought leadership work and research for groups like the Human uh, Services Research Institute, um, Optum Insights, United Health Group, and, and other spaces. And academically, my field is in medical anthropology at um, Boston University. So the areas of my research that I have focused on and where we're gonna live in today is one, burnout, and it's many facets. So from burnout to balance and fulfillment, uh, equity, how does belonging to spaces and to our, our environment or not um, foster a sense of, of wellness and fullness in the workplace? And then how do we make sense of it all? How do we actually use uh, what we know about fulfillment and about creating workplaces of mattering, of belonging to, to actually shape, um, shape others' stories? All right, let's get back to Night Slay's Dragon. So this is kind of what you described, right? So there were no schools trampled. But we're, we're, we're close, right? <laughs> this, is the, this is the narrative. So what I want to do now is pick up the pace, okay? So we're all good talking out loud. We're all good. Like we, we've got a little bit of psychological safety, right? Okay, we're gonna pick up the pace. Get on your Agatha Christie hat because we're gonna start telling some stories. All right, because we love stories. We're storytellers. Suburban housewife goes missing. Who did it? Husband. <laughs> Husband, right? <laughs> there was probably an affair. Soldier wins Purple Heart. What happened? Who's the villain? Who's the victim? Who's the hero in that story? The soldier is the victim. He was injured. And that's why he got the Purple Heart. But he's also the hero. He was saving somebody else. That's right. That's always bothered me when I see wins. Mm, earns. That's a really good call out. That just has bothered. That's a really good call out. 
patient misses fourth appointment. What's the story there? Social determinants of health. Play a role. Could be. That's not the story we usually tell. Yeah. <laughs> non-compliant. <laughs> it is not compliant. Yeah. They're a loser. Uh, another another missed appointment, right? It's their fault. That's right. it's their fault. Police shoots intruder. Mistake. Could be all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Woman assaulted on college campus. What was she wearing? A short skirt. After a party, maybe, right? What else? Alcohol. And I'm throwing this one in here <laughs> because from Winsa Hale. Even a story as short as Appalachia tells an entire narrative without us ever having to fill in the gaps, right? We humans are steeped in stories. We're steeped in stories all the time. The, the accent of the villain. So research shows that four out of five villains in, uh, in Disney movies have a British accent, a deep accent. They're probably petting the cat while they're, while they're <laughs> nefariously plotting the story, right? That um, even in Aladdin, Aladdin was a story around um, this, this woman who was trying to decide who, where, who to marry, how to marry, all of it. And, and we see anti-Arab sentiment coming into the story. And in fact, she only had 10% of lines in a story that was ostensibly about herself. We are steeped in stories and all these stories matter because research says that we begin to ingrain narrative in the way we behave, the way we act, the way we process information by as early as age two. I would argue that it's a little bit earlier than that, but that's the sort of the narrative on that as well. So I focus on it because stories do three things. They shape what we believe about ourselves. So to the extent you know, the, the woman assaulted on college campus, right? It shapes what we believe about women about what is or isn't appropriate, what time a woman should be out or not. The stories inform what we say about ourselves, right? So even like simple linguistic shifts, stories shape the, our beliefs, our language, and thus our behaviors, how we act. If we've heard enough stories that the black and brown communities in our city and our urban area are unsafe, then we, we it creates a bias that when we go into those spaces, when we interact with those people, we clutch our purse a little tighter, right? We're, we second guess our, our decisions to engage or to say hello or open doors. We're, we're more circumspect with how we engage. What's interesting is that not only do stories themselves contain these morals and these messages and behavioral it, it, you know, cues, but the language in stories also tells messages. I mean, stories are made of words, words themselves carry meaning and messages. So things like the language that we might use around, um, you know, rules of thumb. Anybody know where that came from? Idioms that not to beat your, your spouse, well, husband shouldn't beat a, a wife with anything wider than the, their thumb. That's the rules of thumb. But we say that all the time. Grandfather clauses coming from from the, the era of Jim Crow to deny the vote to, to black and brown communities, particularly black communities. But they say interesting stories. So I have another, another sort of uh, um, exercise for you because the way we speak, the words that we use carry stories and shape our behavior. I want you to use, I love chocolate, uh, uh, carrot cake, it's my favorite, um, but we'll use chocolate because it's easier. Somebody say, Chocolate and happy in a sentence. Give me chocolate and happy. So we're going to talk about how language shapes our behavior here. Chocolate makes my husband happy. <laughs> chocolate makes my husband happy. Chocolate makes me happy. All right. How about joy? Use joy and chocolate in a sentence. How might you, how might you talk about that? Chocolate birthday cake brings me joy on my birthday. 
chocolate brings me joy. And this is a we're gonna have to change the syntax a little bit, but like fulfilled or fulfillment. How do you how would one say, and if chocolate and fulfillment work for you, then more power to you. How would you use chocolate and fulfilled in a sentence? chocolate cake needs me feeling fulfilled. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So when we told those, when those sentences were stories, something, we talk about happy and joy. I'm talking about research here in just a second. When we talk about happy and chocolate, we tend to say things like something makes me happy. It is an externality that comes and, and a third party comes and makes me happy. When we talk about joy, it gets more relational. Something brings me joy in order to accept it. There's an exchange there, right? My daughter, my children bring me joy, ergo I have to accept that. Likewise, with fulfillment, we tend to shift into saying I am. And so in a lot of the work that we do around creating these inclusive spaces where our stories are ones of fulfillment, we need to be thinking more about that language of I am so that we become the protagonist in the story and we're speaking I am statements rather than this made me, which is temporal. The same is true in, in um, the flip side. We, when we talk about something made me sad, a movie made me sad, something brought me shame, in order to feel that, we have to accept that. And often you hear this, I'm sure with patients, I am depressed. Rarely I feel. All right, here's my good friend, Leo Tolstoy. I want to talk about the story of healthcare. And the, the narrative of healthcare. So having talked about how much the language matters, the stories matter, tell me the story of healthcare right now. What do you hear on the news? What, what is the story that you swim in as clinicians in the healthcare context? We're exhausted. We're burnt out. COVID, 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 COVID. <laughs> Biggest headline in the nursing world was the woman who was a nurse, former nurse, who was found guilty mm -hmm. of right. error and in harming patients and is waiting sentence. <clears throat> yep. Good story. Yeah, a lot of burnout, a lot of harm, a lot of overwhelm. That has become the narrative in in healthcare. Right. And we hear it talked about in a lot of different contexts, like work life imbalance, moral injury, moral distress, um, even culture, which is always interesting to me that, that there's so much that's put under the, the umbrella of burnout, because you certainly wouldn't do that with a patient to say it was a stomach ache. And these are all these other other factors. We, we get more precise around language. But nevertheless, burnout is the meta narrative in healthcare, Right. Exhaustion. So several years ago, I had more than several, about a decade ago, I was involved in research across the country on burnout on this topic. And I had originally been in a leadership role at the National Institutes of Health, and we were trying to figure out why so many clinicians were leaving um, the, the workforce. And naturally, as a, as a researcher and a writer, I, I went on a journey across the country to ascertain what the story was of the clinical workforce. And I asked the question, tell me about your last bad day. Like what's going on? What is the story you're swimming in right now? And I heard all of these things. If you've seen the National Academies of Medicine um, Wheel of Fortune, <laughs> kind of model the, the, the conceptual framework for burnout, you'll, you'll see that there's, there's a thousand drivers for, for burnout. And as a researcher though, it was kind of uninteresting because there wasn't a lot I could do with that many answers, right? Tolstoy uh, said, it, it wrote in Anna Karenina that all unhappy families are unhappy differently and all happy families are happy in the same way. So when I asked folks to tell me the story of their journey, I was getting uh, the, the bad days, the hardship. I was getting all of these different answers. And then I flipped the script. 
So what I was hearing was this notion of burnout and shaping what they believed about their career in medicine, shaping what they said about themselves in these conversations and the behaviors um, that, that manifested from those, from that sense of, of burnout. So I asked, started asking a different question. Tell me about your last great day. What was going on? What, what was, what was, what brought that smile, brought that joy? I bet if all of you took out your phone and please don't, because it's nice to actually have FaceTime with folks and looked at a photo uh, that brings you just this incredible sense of joy that was like, this is why I, I do me, right? Your pictures would be the same. And, and I know this, having, having asked this question thousands to thousands of, of participants in groups across the country, when we started to flip the script and ask, tell me about, about your last great day, the answers were consistent. It was leading a life of purpose in the context of a community that supports that, right? Being part of a tribe and doing good stuff. And I'm sure that for all of you, if you were to recall the last time you felt that you had a day that was just like, oh, this was a great day. You were doing, doing good stuff with people that, that really supported that, right? So how do we use that information to write new stories? How do we think, how do we flip the script and ask new questions? Well, I already said to question the questions. Question the norms. So there's a fabulous book um, called Being Wrong by Katherine Schultz, which just sort of dives into the margin of error and, and all of the many ways that uh, error shapes belief about ourselves and, and our, our own kind of identity. So I bring this book up and, and welcome, um, because shortly after I had this epiphany, I was traveling with, uh, with a colleague and we were at an airport bar, which is not the most glamorous place to, to find oneself, but it was a really, it was a really cool day. Like I had just slayed it and some presentations and interviewing folks and all of it. And so I found myself at this airport bar with a colleague and I had saddled up to the bar, right? And I, this was before my own COVID-19, uh, when I was just like, really like had the perfect suit on, I was a trim and, and all of it. And I'm like sitting at the bar and I ordered the, the, the right martini and, and, and all of this, like the whole narrative was right. Right. I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm a single mother, but my kid's taken care of. Like I just laid this meeting. I've got it. I'm traveling and I'm doing all the stuff that I was supposed to do that. Like the world said, this is the picture of success. I even knew how to order my martini, extra dry, straight up with a twist. I had like, I had it nailed. And I saw this woman across the bar and uh, she looked like Olivia Pope from Scandal and just glamorous and beautiful. And she was doing the very same thing. And I thought, man, I am really lonely. Like who the hell wrote this story that I'm living? Like, why is this the story? Why is this my narrative? And I had just spent all of this, this time with clinicians who were talking about their bad days, their highs, their lows, all of it. And I thought, wow, I am, I am in the same boat, right? I am living somebody else's story that was written for me millennia ago, right? Of what success looks like, how it feels. And so I started to interrogate, like, why? Like, why am I living this story? So I started to question norms. And there's this, this wonderful concept called pessimistic meta-induction. And I say this with some levity, but if it's, you know, most of what we believe now, uh, well, I'll read it. Most of what we used to believe, excuse me, uh, was true is wrong, that the earth is flat that success looks like three inch heels at an airport bar drinking a martini by yourself. Ergo, most of what we now believe is true is likely wrong. And again, I say this with levity, but, I, but it's important because it, we start, when we start to have a different vantage point and start thinking, whose story am I living? Is it really true? 
Is this the truth that I, that I believe for myself, that I believe of others? Is burnout really the narrative of healthcare? Does it have to be? Can we change those things? So the stories that we begin to tell and shape and think about and the, those behaviors and how that we, we manifest them become a fun exercise in looking around the world and saying, we could change that. We could do that differently. We also started, I started to question standards. When we, we start to think about different stories, writing different narratives, part of that becomes questioning standards. I love Dr. Collins with like every fiber of my being. <laughs> and we used to work for him when I was at NIH. And one day I was taking my amazing human uh, down the hall to meet him. <laughs> And it was very exciting for me to be at building one and, you know, like have her, you know, that she was must have been seven or eight at the time. And we're walking down and it's a dude hall. Let's be honest. <laughs> All the old, the, the pictures of, of the, the um, you know, former directors and primarily older, rather alabaster. Um, and we were chatting about just you know, life and food and all of this. So and I was talking to my daughter and we happened to say the same thing at the same time. So I responded like many of us do great minds think alike. Think alike. Think alike. and like from the lips of babes, right? My daughter stopped and looked around and she's like, do they do great minds think alike? And she was seeing faces that don't look like hers. And I thought, wow, how many times have I said that to a little human whose brain is forming, that great minds think alike, that likeness is greatness. So that the stories that we tell fit a narrative, that we have to fit a narrative, that the damsel is pretty and tiny and blonde and has a hat and, and the, the knight is white and and is strong and, and traditionally quote masculine right slain slain dragons this really set me off as you can imagine after a very emotional like sobbing in the hallway of building one and makeup like running <laughs> and francis thinking what are you doing i'm like oh my gosh so I started to, to interrogate though, how do we really write new stories? How do we like practically do that? And how do we partner with folks to hold us accountable to think about the narratives that we've told about ourselves and shape in, in others when we, we um, get into sort of the brass tacks. Maya Angelou wrote that there is no greater tragedy than bearing the untold story. The things about ourselves that are just like, behind the, the the door that we feel like we can't we can't always express and and there's this interesting thing that happens when we start to to like proactively put pen to paper and i mean this very tactically like that we, we were having dinner last evening and we we're talking about the tactile experiences of of like this sort of change making work like literally putting pen to paper and it's powerful, it changes the brain. When we move from this story was written about me, right? To I am the protagonist in my story. And you see this I'm sure with, with patients often, right? That moment when it, it shifts from even the language of health disparity to health agency. Like now I am the, I am the director of my own movie. I am the protagonist of my own book. I, I get to make choices. And importantly, once we do that, we the messy parts are, are the best parts. I mean, who turns the movie off when the guy gets shot? The, you know, I, we were mentioning actually even last night, I'll, I'll go biblical, like when Jesus dies, whatever, you know, in, in these contexts, like when the when the main character trips and fails and makes it makes that decision that's when we lean in we're like what happens next what choice did you make why and we give a lot more empathy and kindness and compassion to the choices that led to that that point because we get it like we've been there so we stop editing out the parts of ourselves that we're ashamed of rather than accepting that shame we just we sort of weave it into a story but we don't have to take it 
we can write a new narrative. Messy is the best part. And part of that is because we get to write whatever ending we want, right? We don't, and it was, it's funny, I, I do a lot of, of coaching. And one of the exercises that I do with, with uh, clients and, and um, in classrooms is having folks write up to like the truth, up to whatever point they feel comfortable, and then make up anything they want. Mm -hmm. Just write an ending <clears throat> or start at the ending and back into it. So what is the ending? It, you know, write, when you think about like writing an obituary, what are, what's your epitaph? What is the ending that, that you, you want? And you know, it can be iterative, it can be a work in progress, but it's yours, right? And in that process, we make the meaning. We decide what points mattered, what, what of those obstacles really mattered to us and how we want to move forward and the meaning that we wanna make. That's a really powerful, powerful um, exercise. So again, getting, getting really tactical. When I do coaching and, and writing with, uh, in a thought leadership space with clients, we do a lot of just riffing. Like, like tell me the, there's something called a loss line or a, a grief line where people will write, you know, highs and lows of their lives, right? And kind of start to see patterns. What's striking about that exercise, because I use it in the context of writing and thought leadership, is taking the moments that like, you know, we all have the big ones, marriage, divorce, death, loss, like the big stuff, but it's the spaces between them that become really interesting. So yeah, lots of us have experienced divorce or a death or, or something, but what happened in the middle? Like what's between those hash marks? How did you make sense of that? What, what choices did you make from those moments that, that really drive interesting narrative? So it's a good exercise if you're thinking of exploring the space. So lastly, and I wanna spend, I wanna spend the bulk of our, our time sort of in the tail end just having a conversation. Um, but I would say the, the, you know, the biggest question that I get asked given my, my world of research and, and, and my focus on, on writing and narrative now is, all right, what's the secret sauce? <laughs> like, how do we, how do we write burnout out of our narrative? How do we, how do we focus on, on doing more that is fulfilling and, and less of, that is not? And the two things I would say consistently going right back to the research is this notion of how do we live purpose-driven lives in the context of community, the context of others. So first step for me and, and for, um, and I've, I've published on this, I'm happy to circulate it, but first is, is community. Identifying your community, identifying your people. And your people might just be one person, right? Or two people. How do we create community spaces where we can process, we can talk about narrative, we can we can pull, we can hold each other accountable for saying, you know what, you don't have to believe that about yourself. Like I I see something different in you. Or holding people accountable when words fall out of our mouth about our own insecurities that somebody can kind of stop us. So that those community spaces where we have accountability and connection and love and laughter. That stuff is hard work, right? Maintaining community. And it is the greatest joys that we have. There's a wonderful study that was done. Um, it's ongoing. It's at Harvard uh, looking at, at longevity. And I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, and the, the title of the study is escaping me at the moment, but um, it's been going on for, you know, for 60 years or so. And the biggest difference in people who quote, lived well, through self-reported happiness and, and a sense of living a fulfilled life, even if they had health, health challenges and so forth, was having a strong community, strong primary relationships. So finding your people. And second, through that finding purpose. And not, and this is a little harder to do, but I will say in the finding your purpose, one of the things that can be very, very helpful is starting to write your narrative. 
right? Just even recording it, thinking about it, writing like that, those highs and lows and seeing the patterns. Like, when are you really at your best? Like, when do you like go home and think I had a great day? I, my work has meaning and it's striking for me. I, I was doing this with my, my fiance recently. Um, I love to plan parties. Like who knew, right? <laughs> That's not something that I'm particularly good at that. And being good at it is not a deterrent for doing it. Right. But it was interesting. We started doing these lost lines and, and trying to look at like, where are, where are high highs, where are low lows, and, and looking at some patterns. God bless therapists in, in the world. Um, but with, with some coaching with a third party and the things that I thought gave me meaning in retrospect, as I really started to look at the patterns, weren't my best days, right? It was stuff like farming. It was getting hands in the dirt. It was, you know, what are the other spaces that we find real connection to ourselves and to others? And it might surprise you. I think in my, my experience, it always, always has. I say this again with a little bit of levity, when all else fails, get a hobby. <laughs> and uh, so I keep, I keep walking too close to this. Um, when all else fails, get a hobby. And I say this with levity, but with intent. With, and especially for some of the like earlier careers, actually at any stage of career, but I find that um, in my experience, when you go through these lost lines, when you think about what gives you purpose and, you're, and you talk about your narrative and the things that are really joy driven for, for many in the healthcare sector in particular, we don't give enough time or credence to just dabbling, to thinking, to playing in the yard, to playing a musical instrument and really connecting. And that's also a really important time where we synthesize our stories. Right. When we're having that like mindful space, doing something with our hands that's outside of the, the environment of a clinical setting where you can just like be, be you. So I always love to throw that one on there. All right. So I will end with this and then we can open up. Um, how many of you have seen Inside Out? If you haven't seen Inside Out, I cannot recommend it highly enough. So by just, just for a little context, it's kind of the voices in a girl's head manifested as characters. So the woman in the middle is joy. This guy is angry. <laughs> so they each, they each embody an emotion. And I, I bring this up because when we think about creating these, like rewriting these narratives, that are driven, are designed to sort of drive purpose and foster agency. One of the things that I hear often is, well, my days are all the same, that I'm just overwhelmed, I'm exhausted, like I don't have time. And I love the movie because when we start to think of joy, for example, as a person, or anger as a person, um, or anxiety, like embody that write it down, court them, court joy as a person, as a character in your story, right? So when was the last time you hung out with joy? What does joy look like? What does joy smell like? What does joy like to do? We do this with partners often or friends or in our communities, but how do we do this for ourselves? When was the last time you just like hung out with laughter as a character, right? Do you make time to hang out with laughter? Most of us don't, <laughs> but we remember when we did. Khalil Gibran has this beautiful poem on, on life as a house, and you'll appreciate it as Southerners and Southern hospitality. We welcome joy, joy leaves, we welcome grief, and we make it comfortable, we give it sweet tea, and then we usher it on. <laughs> but knowing, when we think about, start to think about emotions like this as characters in our story and giving them equal airtime, right? And enjoying their presence and then ushering them on because that's the nature of, of how characters are written. It can be a very cool exercise to think about how you, you write in joy and fulfillment into your stories. So I'm going to end there, but naturally you can know how to reach me.
Um, and we'll open up the, the floor to comments and questions. And for our in-person participants, please feel free to just ask your question. Um, and I will be monitoring the Q&A here uh, for our Zoom participants. Go for it. I'm, I'm curious, what um, what was your specific feedback for that research you did with predictive Brown? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's getting published, it's so forthcoming, um, but two things stood out. Um, one, I mean, no surprise, the drivers of, bur of burnout are, are myriad and um, actually three things stood out. And, and so, um, and skewing towards systems rather than, than individual um, kind of work. That's not surprising. Um, what was interesting was the role of agency. And so for clinicians that were engaged in some kind of sort of agency driven work, like um, I remember meeting with a group of, of clinicians, like white coats for black lives, um, working towards gun violence issues, things, things around that when, when clinicians had a kind of purpose outside of the clinical space. Um, that seemed to be a buffer. Um, there's good research on that. So again, it's not wildly new, but it was really striking uh, how, how important um, it, engaging in, in sort of advocacy was. Um, in fact, I, I know Dr. Natalie May has worked with Tim Cunningham to, to develop the book on self-care for nurses. And um, I did it, sat for an interview for that that talks a lot about the role of advocacy and agency in, in mitigating burnout. So just um, that. The last thing that, uh, again, I love being back in my native uh, South that will, you, you'll appreciate is that so often when we have conversations around burnout, um, fulfillment, self-care, all of these, all these sorts of things in the workplace, um, the setting, we don't really think too much about the setting in which we're having those conversations. So we do them here, <laughs> right? We go into a room in the middle of the day and we ask folks to respond to a series of questions or we send you a survey and you have to, to respond. Mm -hmm. um, I published in the New England Journal of Medicine a piece on the power of breaking bread as a, a, an avenue to, to look at burnout and talk about burnout. Because what happened when I, I think part of it was because I was trying to meet with so many groups, I started to just have dinner and meals with folks across the country. And just by virtue of clinicians coming together over a shared meal, and it's been a long time since there's been physicians lounges or, or spaces like that, but coming together over a shared meal, you could see this transition from talking about burnout and their horrible day and, and you know, loss and grief and all into, then it went into, um, oh, you have kids too? Oh, I have kids. And then it went into, like, it started to, to move to, the, by the time we were done with the meal, here we were supposed to be having like a focus group on burnout. And by the time we were done, we fed our bodies and our souls and people were like, oh, should, we should do this again. So I actually run a number of dinner clubs for clinicians across the country um, that have been women only or new parents, uh, clinical groups and, and others. But it's been, that was really striking. I was, was doing just breaking bread with, with others. Go for it. I find that really interesting how you said, like, not just challenging the stories we believe about ourselves, but also how that influences what we say about ourselves. You know, I find so often, you know, when you're just making like quick comments or even humor, like, kind of even the humor that you use, like the gallows humor or whatever, kind of reinforces these stories of burnout or whatever, while believing it, hating it, feeling in the moment can like perpetuate that. So, what has been your experience with like, being mindful and challenging those things in the moment, like thinking before you say things like that. I love that. I love that. I mean, how many times when somebody's like, how was your day? Oh, I'm hanging in there, you know, getting through it. Like we start because we know that there's already this narrative. We're just like, just, you know, well, you know how it is. So just holding yourself accountable. 
I mean, stopping and thinking or asking different questions rather than saying, so how, how are you doing? Saying, um, what you have for dinner last night? I mean, even if it's totally random and then people start to like respond differently, right? In the same way, when a patient comes into the, the room and you're like, how you doing? You know, what brings you in here today? Instead, ask the question, how do you want to leave the space today? Like, what's, what, what's going on in your world that we can work on to get together today? Like shifting the question so that you can in, in turn shift the way we think about, um, about the answer. So I'm a pediatrician and I love that uh, uh, story you told about your daughter and, you know, how she was able to sort of reflect on the situation in the moment with such clarity. And so a couple questions. One is um, children figure a lot of the stuff out by in play. They create stories naturally. They in inhabit stories naturally. They, they just love moving back and forth within that. At certain ages, of course, the stories are as real as reality to them, but then they kind of move away from that, but still understand that there's power there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you've had a chance to think about, because you mentioned hobbies, you know, just that sense of play and having fun, like that's been very useful to me. Like, okay, is this going to be fun or what are we going to do for fun this weekend? Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like, just because it's fun um, and who are we going to get together with because they're fun to be with. So I, it, you know, I, I wonder about that. And then the second question I, I have is um, when we travel, we make a point of being displaced. Like a part of the adventure of traveling is creating a story and the narrative of that experience that begins with being displaced. And it's something that we've, we've done with our kids and our family over time because we wanted to create that family narrative that was about adventure, exploration, autonomy, universality, you know, just in the context of, of doing it, of actually doing it and living it and creating the story as you go mm -hmm. along. And our kids are now in their 20s and 30s, and it's fun to hear them talk about how those different adventures that we had are a part of their own narrative now. And we see it played out in them as adults, of course. But so I'm still, I'm sort of, and that's, that goes along in a sense with play. And fun. Exactly right. So I'm just wondering if you have some thoughts about that. I just no. <laughs> Except that that's so beautiful. No, I, I I think you you defined it beautifully and and the sense of play and kind of getting out there. One of the things that I noticed when especially when my daughter was little and she was playing and and like I was sort of vicariously playing through her and with her, but you start to notice how things smell or feel or you know we describe things even like if you ask your kid about their day at school well not anymore since she's a teenager but when she was little it would be like and molly had on a pink dress and it had frills and it, da, 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 and then they, they are like right there and so the play becomes this interesting narrative too that puts them fully in a different and, and unique environment so we just it's almost like um it becomes a space for mindfulness because we're paying different kinds of attention. We're paying attention to, to the temperature in the space, if it's if there's cookies baking, like all of those other things in terms of play, which I think is really, if you can't, if you don't have the patience or the sort of mindset to quietly meditate and I'm the worst at it, play is another way to meditate, like playing in the garden where you're noticing. Um, and and there's, a, there's a different sort of tactile space. I like that a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to have to quote you on that. So I'm going to try to bring uh, two questions that have come in uh, through Zoom together. Uh, and, and, and this, one of the participants is asking about sort of the intentionality of thinking about our own stories. And another participant has, has mentioned sort of almost as an example, what about those stories that are sort of push pushed in our direction that we don't necessarily agree with as clinicians. This participant says, I started to work in an ICU pre-pandemic and this uh, nursing team spent so much time talking about how burned out we were when actually we had a great community and things were good. Morale was bad because everyone was committed to the narrative 
uh, that quote, things were awful, but they were not. And that always stuck with me, uh, this person says. And so how do we, how do you recommend, you know, whether it's students, trainees, uh, clinicians that are in the workforce, how do we reflexively work through that challenge of being intentional about what story we say? We, we stamped that one, but this one is, is not, a pro, you know, not good for us. That's fantastic. I, I know that during COVID, this, this is particularly apropos. Um, and it doesn't, it, it reminds me of, of sort of soldiers and, and the work of a different kind of front line where, you know, for some folks, COVID, it, clinical folks, COVID has been utterly devastating. Right. It's been it's it's tragic and, and there is a sense of burnout and overwhelm for others. You've had a clear sense of purpose. Like you go in, you know what you got to do. Likewise, in, in a military context, it like war. There's a Langston Hughes wrote this poem and he says, what a grand time was the war. My, my, what a grand time was the war In wartime. We had fun. I'm sorry that old war is done. Oh, did someone die? it was laser focused on like like mission and people and community and knew what he had to do and then it's like oh my god now i gotta go back and like i mean i have to deal with kids and marriage and family and relationships and so there there is for there's always dual narratives there's what we like i said say about ourselves what people are saying about us and the narrative they put us in so i would say for folks like that to write to write to write and to maintain a tribe of people with whom you can connect and tell stories and be make sure and, and authentic stories. Right. So for that, the individual that is actually doing doing quite all right in, in their context, then that's okay. Like make sure that you keep your keep grounded with your people. Um, for sure. And and I, I do say the writing piece just because I think that there's something really beautiful about putting things on the page and then we have to put the pen down right so we get to tell these wonderful stories and then we can just like set them here and revisit them later but but hold to that truth in that time um, that's really lovely other thoughts i know we are right yeah. at time so, time for one more question i certainly have one but if anybody else wants to ask um so i'm curious what your thoughts are on what narrative can't do um are there you know certainly in the world of narrative medicine and narrative health we are so focused on trying to bring narratives and mm -hmm. good ways um into uh, our conversations and our self-conceptions but are there things that it can't do or doesn't do well or things that we need to think about you know taking a different path to have you seen that in your work and research yes and the way i the, the first thing that came to mind as you were talking about it is that narrative is data it is it is a it is a body of of data it is not data a la science <laughs> sort of peer-reviewed in that world and so i think there's a real crisis in the medical community right now where um, because narrative is so compelling and that is how people learn and listen and remember and think and all of that in, beyond the medical community in particular, that we're, we're skewing a little bit too much at times to like just telling a super compelling story. And I think that that has its own, that's fraught with its own challenges. And so I think how we in the medical community and the healthcare community marry data and narrative becomes a really important skill set um, so that you see the data and the data tells stories too. And so you can kind of come up with it um, so that we're not losing that in in just, I mean, one anecdote isn't data. Like one story isn't isn't um, sufficient, and and so I think there's there's a there's work to be done in marrying the data and the story. So, awesome! Well, thank you.
unfortunately, unfortunately out of time. Thank you to Liz for that phenomenal discussion. And I, I love sort of our, our, our orders here to think about how we bring together data and narrative um, as maybe two sides of the same coin or something like that um, to extend metaphors. Um, thank you again uh, for coming today, those of our in-person participants. Uh, thank you to our Zoom participants. Uh, a reminder that you can get uh, continuing education credit uh, for today's event, and there will be slides that show here at the end for those of you on, on Zoom uh, where you can do that. Uh, there is no formal medical center hour next week, uh, but we are co-sponsoring an event next Monday with several groups from the University and the Charlottesville community. Uh, this will be on Zoom only. Uh, it is on Monday, again, a Monday event instead of a, a Wednesday event um, on April 4th from noon to one, featuring Kate Bowler, author of the New York Times bestseller, mm -hmm. Everything Happens for a Reason. Um, and for those on our email list, look for a special email announcement with that Zoom link included. Uh, the Medical Center Hour will return uh, to its usual Wednesday time slot on April 13th. And thank you all again and have a great week.